Hi, have you ever wondered how this universe that we all call home came to be? Lots of theories about the origins of our universe have come and gone until one theory in particular came along that physicists and cosmologists could agree on. They agreed on it, of course, because there is scientific evidence to support it. And you may have heard of it. It's called the Big Bang Theory. The founders of this theory are two scientists from the 1920s, Georges Lemaitre and Alexander Friedman. They both used Einstein's theory of relativity to prove that the universe is in a constant state of expansion. Then in 1929, the American astronomer Edwin Hubble confirmed this theory again after observing evidence that virtually all clusters of galaxies appear to be moving away from all other clusters, which also indicates that the entire universe is expanding. Physicists agree that the theory is sound because the universe is, in fact, still expanding even now. If you open the Quran and read through all the verses that speak about the origin of the universe, you will find that it confirms what physicists have been saying about the same topic. For example, in chapter 51, verse 47, it says, And it is we, God, who have built the heaven with our creative power. And verily, it is we, God, who are steadily expanding it. What we know about the universe is that space was created first and gave birth to particles, galaxies, stars, the Earth and you and me. In several places, the Quran also addresses the order in which various things were created in a manner consistent with what science has discovered. For example, in chapter 18, verse 51, it says, I, God, did not make them witness to the creation of the heavens and the Earth or to the creation of themselves. The universe expanded from very high density and exploded in gravitational waves. The same gravitational waves from those colliding black holes in space that pass through the Earth, causing the universe to stretch and expand over and over again. In chapter 41 of the Quran, verse 10, it says, In four days he made in the Earth what anchors from high above it and put baraka in it, and equally measured out sustenance of its dwellers for those who ask. Let's break down the meaning of this verse. When God says he made in the earth what anchors from above it, he's referring to the gravitational waves that are coming back from those colliding black holes in space that act as gravitational anchors to anchor the earth and anchor things to the earth. Then God says he put baraka in it. Baraka is a word that people commonly use for blessings, but it actually has a deeper meaning. It means to grow and increase in volume above and beyond expectations, emphasizing that the earth started out small, but constantly grew larger and larger. A strange type of matter caused the expansion of the universe in its early stages. This matter behaved very differently from the matter that we're familiar with today because instead of attracting other matter, it repels it. This has led physicists to call it antimatter. Sounds to me like antisocial matter. Antimatter actually disobeys energy and momentum conservation. It disobeys symmetric charge conjugation and parity. And it disobeys our current one directional time arrow and disobeys causality. Because the early universe was filled with this type of self-repelling, disobedient matter, everything would be pushing against everything else, and that would account for the sudden explosion that gave birth to the universe. Matter and antimatter particles are always produced in pairs, and if they come in contact, they annihilate one another, leaving behind pure energy. So why do we still see matter today? As far as physicists can tell, it's only because in the end there was one extra matter particle for every billion matter-antimatter pairs. After that, the first stars began to form. They formed from the dense gas of the young universe, which came about when a cloud increased in density and then collapsed due to the action of the gravitational pull of gravity. The gravitational pull of gravity managed to anchor more and more matter from the collapsed cloud, resulting in the densest gas clumping and anchoring together, which eventually led to the formation of stars and even galaxies. The formation of stars then paved the way for the formation of everything else in our universe. You see, when a massive star with a mass several times that of the sun reaches the end of its life, it compresses and explodes as a supernova. And it appears that exploding stars or supernova are extremely efficient at producing the dust or first solid particles that later forms Earth, like planets, rocks and people. Verse 11 of that same chapter in the Quran addresses these points when it says, Then he directed himself to the heaven while it was smoke and said to the heavens and the earth, Come into being, willing to obey or disobey. They both said, We are willing to obey. 
From this verse we can derive many things. Firstly, that space was created before earth. As God says, he created the earth while heaven was a smoke. When God says, while it was smoke about the heavens, it's confirming scientific belief that the smoke resulting from the exploding stars or supernova existed in space for a long time before forming the rocky embryo of the earth. So essentially, the Earth was a giant lump of this cosmic dust anchored by gravity that constantly grew larger and larger. Once it became large enough, gravity caused the Earth to become rounded, forming what is called a rocky embryo. And after a hundred million years of this rocky embryo growing, voila, we have planet Earth. The Quran even alludes to the matter and antimatter that existed in the universe in this verse when it says willing to obey or disobey and then concludes by telling us that it is matter, not antimatter, that managed to survive and still exist to this day when it says they said we are willing to obey. When astrophysicists joke, they say supernova have bad habits because they belch out huge quantities of smoke known as cosmic dust. Dr. Loretta Dunn of Cardiff University describes cosmic dust by saying cosmic dust consists of tiny particles of solid material floating around in the space between stars. It's not the same as house dust, but more akin to cigarette smoke. Cosmic dust was also responsible for blocking the light emitted from stars and galaxies, meaning that for the first 380,000 years or so, our universe was essentially too opaque to shine. Physicist Imre Bartos from Columbia University states, gravitational waves arrive at Earth long before any light does, which is exactly what verse 12 of chapter 41 indicates. He made in each heaven its affair and adorned the nearest heaven with lamps. By using the lamps as an analogy for light, this verse reflects the fact that the universe was in darkness in its early stages. It further reflects the sequence of events we discussed earlier, as God mentioned what anchors first, then mentioned the light, implying that gravitational waves arrived at Earth long before any light did, just as physicists such as Imre Bartos would confirm over 1400 years later. Hi. On September the 7th, 2014, in an article in the Daily Mail, the famous physicist Professor Stephen Hawking warns that according to his calculations, the planet we're living in is unstable and therefore might collapse. This news, unsurprisingly, sent the media world into a buzz. Dr. Joseph Licken, a theoretical physicist at the University of Chicago, confirmed Professor Hawkins' findings when he said, if you use all the physics that we know now and you do what you think is a straightforward calculation, it is bad news, and it may be that the universe we live in is inherently unstable. We're sort of right on the edge where the universe can last for a long time, but eventually it should go boom. There's no principle that we know of that would put us right on the edge. Dr. Benjamin Alnett, a theoretical physicist at the University of Cambridge, further elaborates on the reason for this instability when he talks about a particular particle that exists in the universe called the Higgs boson particle. Higgs boson. The observed 126 giga electron volts Higgs boson mass seems to imply the universe does not exist in the lowest possible energy state, but is in fact positioned in a slightly unusual place. If the Higgs boson mass were really 127 giga electron volts and the top mass were a little lower than its most likely value, then actually the universe would be completely stable and the vacuum would be in the true minimum. Meaning that under the simplest assumptions, the measured mass of Higgs could mean that the universe is unstable and destined to fall apart. So basically, according to numerous physicists, careful calculations and computations, we're all doomed. The Quran, which dates back 1400 years ago, substantiates the predictions and calculations of physicists such as Hawking, Lichen and Alenach. The potential of the universe collapsing and being wiped out is real. The creator of the universe is well aware of what he created. But it's not all bad news. The Quran then goes on to assure us that God prevents the universe from collapse when he writes in the Quran, God holds the heaven from falling on the earth. Furthermore, the Quran states that God prevents the universe from being wiped out. God holds the heavens and the earth lest they are wiped out. So what will the end of the world look like exactly? And what part do the Higgs boson particles play in all this? Very good question. In 1960, the British scientist Peter Higgs predicted the existence of tiny particles that we cannot see, but that are, in fact, in us and all around us. 
These particles are responsible for giving objects their mass and explain why particles have the mass that they do. Without Higgs boson, you and I and everything we see around us would have no mass and therefore would not be able to exist. The other physicists at that time also agreed with Mr Higgs that this particle exists as he had sound calculations to prove his theory and they called these subatomic particles Higgs particles after Peter Higgs. On March the 14th, 2013, about half a century after it was first predicted, scientists at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, tentatively confirmed they have found the Higgs boson particle, and the Nobel Prize in Physics was subsequently awarded jointly to Peter Higgs and his colleague François Englert. In order to discover the subatomic Higgs particle, CERN had built a large hadron collider at the cost of about $10 billion to simulate the conditions of the formation of the universe. In 1993, a group of British physicists went to the UK science minister at the time, William Waldegrave, to ask if he could help fund the building of the large hadron collider in order to help prove the existence of the Higgs particle. Having no clue what they were talking about, Mr. Waldegrove announced he would award a vintage bottle of champagne to the physicist who came up with the best way to explain the Higgs field and the Higgs boson to the general public. And it was Professor David Miller who took home the prize with his famous analogy. Imagine a cocktail party of political party workers who are uniformly distributed across the floor, all talking to their nearest neighbours. If the ex-Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher enters the room, many of the workers will run toward her and form a cluster around her. As she moves, other workers run toward her, while the ones she has left return to their places. Because of the knot of people running toward her forming a cluster and then returning back to their spots, she acquires mass. These clusters, which run towards Mrs. Thatcher and then disappear as they return back to their spots, are an analogy to Higgs bosons. So if that's the Higgs field, how does the Higgs boson fit into all of this? Let's pretend our crowd of partygoers is uniformly spread across the room. Now consider a rumour passing through our room full of people. Those near the door run to hear it first and cluster together to get the details. Then they return to their original spots and tell their neighbours, who then run and cluster together to hear it too. Then they return to their original spots and tell their next neighbours and so on. The result will be a wave of clusters running across the room that disappear as soon as they run. These clusters are an analogy to Higgs bosons. So to summarise, Higgs boson is an elusive subatomic particle that we can't see but can see how it gives particles substance or mass. It's essentially what gives shape, size and mass to everything that exists. But the problem is that the Higgs particle that the LHC had found possesses a mass of approximately 126 giga electron volts. And this has made physicists rather nervous because they believe it should be 127. According to physicists such as Stephen Hawking, Joseph Lichen and Benjamin Allenach, this discrepancy could very well mean the collapse of the universe and everything in it, including you and I, as everything will become massless and they are not alone in their assertions. In fact, the Quran also swears that this will take place when the world ends, when it says, it is the day when people will be like scattered moths and the mountains shall be as loosened wool. People like moths and mountains like wool sounds like mass loss to me. But there's something else too. In chapter 81 of the Quran, a chapter where God describes in detail the events of the end of the world, there are two particular verses that are of great interest to us and what we've just learned. So verily I, God, swear by clusters you can't see, as soon as they run, they disappear. That's the English translation, but the words used in the original Arabic are more nuanced than a translation can express. Three words in particular that are used in this verse are khunes and al-jawari al khunes Khunes refers to something invisible and al-jawari means something that is running. al khunes refers to something that disappears and returns back to its original spot. So if you put the three words together, we're talking about invisible clusters that run and that disappear almost as soon as they appear. Almost as soon as they start running, they stop and disappear. So what are these clusters that the Quran is describing? than none other than the infamous and elusive Higgs boson particles, which explains why the end of the universe will come about not due to volcanic activity, meteor showers, or an asteroid hitting the Earth, as NASA claims. The universe will end due to mass loss.